That is the Mustang badge, and no brand courted controversy more than Ford when it stuck that badge on this midsize SUV. That's right, today we're looking at the Mustang Mach-E, which after a long delay is finally available in Australia. The question is, is it too little too late now that most of this car's rivals are more established in our market? Or is there something truly special about this car? Does it earn that Mustang badge? Let's find out. To start with price, the Mac e isn't exactly here to be a new affordable EV. Instead, it looks to sit about the middle of the pack when it comes to electric midsize SUVs. And compared to the combustion coupe which inspired it, even the cheapest version comes in at a higher starting price. Three Mac e grades arrive in Australia, the base select rear-wheel drive, the mid-spec premium rear-wheel drive, and the top-spec all-wheel drive GT. With price tags ranging between almost $80,000 to almost $108,000 before you start adding on-road costs, the Mac e competes with the likes of the Hyundai Ioniq 5, Kia EV6, Tesla Model Y, and if only on price, the Polestar 2. Key to any EV, of course, is driving range, and the Mac e delivers with big battery packs at each grade, offering healthy traveling distances between charges. You get roughly 470 kilometers for the base select and up to 600 kilometers for the premium, according to the more accurate WLTP testing cycle, making it at least competitive, if not better, with most of our aforementioned rivals. You're not left wanting for performance either, with the Mac e offering solid motor outputs to try and earn that pony badge. We'll talk a bit more on that later. While you're not exactly buying a cheap EV here then, at least the Mac-E does a reasonable job of looking after you on the spec front. Equipment highlights on the base car include LED headlights, 19-inch alloy wheels, synthetic leather interior trim with 8-way power adjust and heating for the driver, a massive 15.5-inch multimedia touchscreen in that portrait layout with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, a matching wireless charging bay, a 10.2-inch instrument cluster, as well as the full safety suite and 360-degree parking camera. The base car even gets a panoramic fixed sunroof and premium Bang & Olufsen audio system, something usually reserved only for top-spec rivals. Next up is the premium, which on top of its longer range and upgraded power output, scores a higher grade set of LED headlights, contrasting exterior trim, black headliner, red stitching for the interior, as well as metal scuff plates and pedals. Finally, the top spec GT scores all wheel drive, a massive boost to power and torque, the Magna Ride adaptive suspension system, larger 20 inch alloy wheels, a Brembo brake package, GT styling touches inside and out, as well as interior ambient lighting and bespoke sporty front seats with additional bolstering. All in all, there's not too much to differentiate the grades. Honestly, the base car is quite a value pick compared to its rivals with a solid range and the lion's share of equipment, leaving a potential buyer to weigh up whether they want range, performance or value. Now, Ford was asking for a little bit of trouble when they put that Mustang badge on an EV in the first place, but to put it on a midsize SUV, even though it's not really a traditional midsize SUV, well, that was something different entirely. Now, if you take a look here, I do think it looks more Ford SUV than it does Mustang with that kind of bulbous kind of face, but there are homages present. You've got the badge, obviously, but you've also got the frowny face headlights and a little bit going on with the kind of black contrast clusters on this mid-spec car we've got here around the back and you've again got a set of LED lights which are in that iconic Mustang bar shape, a strong body line and a little spoiler jutting out the rear. Again, that SUV height is ever present and it almost looks more European premium coupe SUV than it does anything else. Now, before we hop on the inside, there is one thing I should point out and it's the fact that the Mac E doesn't have any traditional door handles. Instead, it's got this little button that you press and this little fin that you can use to pull the door out. And if you look over on the driver's side as well, this panel here has a code on it. And the reason for that is you can leave the key in the car if you wanted to go for a swim or something, and then you can put your code in to unlock the car and hop back in. Kind of a neat touch. Now in here, well, it's definitely not a Mustang in here. The Combustion Coupe was never known for its upmarket practical interiors. It was all designed around making you feel like you were driving a big V8 muscle car. But here in the Mach-E, it's a step way into the future. It's a completely different space from what you'd usually expect 
not just from a Mustang, but from a Ford just generally. There's all sorts of interesting textures that I didn't expect in this Mach-E. And the seating position, well, it's definitely an SUV seating position. You're sitting way off the ground. I feel like I can peer down over that bonnet. Just lots of like unexpected factors about this car. That screen obviously dominates the space and it's lovely to have a digital dash cluster unlike some EVs on the market too. If you're expecting even a hint of the old world Mustang, it's not really here. Again, with a lot of Fords, the interior is a little monotone. And in terms of texture, well, that's something that a lot of this car's contemporaries are exploring more. The use of recycled materials, unconventional patterns, and elements like that. But on that front, I think the Mach-E plays it pretty safe. Now on the inside, you are offered almost all the benefits of a midsize SUV in here. It's quite spacious, it's quite open, and there's lots of storage as well, including a nice cup holder in the door here with a bit of a map pocket going on. There's larger cup holders in the center here for your bigger bottles, a wireless phone charger with a little tray here, which is really nice, and it's rubberized too, so stuff doesn't move around too much. You've got your two ports under there, and you've got a pass-through as well underneath, very EV styled, so you can fit more stuff in. And the same goes for this big uh, armrest, floating armrest console box with a closing lid as well, which all lovely touches. Now, the one downside is you do have to control all of your climate functions through this touch screen here, which is something that we're never huge fans of, but it's not too bad because there is a permanent strip for it on the SYNC 4 system. It's not just something that you have to bring up from a tray or a sub menu, so that's appreciated as well. And even on the base car, you're getting the eight-way power adjust for the seat too, which is a nice touch. Okay, back seat. So I think in here, the space is actually pretty good. That's behind my own driving position. And as you can see, miles of room for my knees, plenty of space to put my feet. And the floor is flat in here, like it should be in any good EV, making the most of that platform. One thing I didn't mention when I was sitting in the front is the seats are actually really spongy in the Mac-E. They look a little flat, but actually not. You sink into them quite nicely. And one of the tricks to make the space feel a bit bigger that they've done in here is actually tilt the base of the seat back a bit so you sink into it and your knees have somewhere to slide back to, which is nice. Uh, in the door here, this sort of uh, pull is a bit far out, which makes your cup holder a bit small and it makes room for that big Bang & Olufsen speaker. Again, that's on the base car too. And there's the big panoramic roof, which doesn't have a cover. Might be a bit awkward in that Australian summer because it can heat this cabin up quite a bit. Although with the app, you can remotely turn that air conditioning on and cool the cabin down, but it's just something you have to remember to do because there is no cover even as an accessory for that sunroof. Uh, back here, in terms of other storage, You've got some pockets on the backs of the seats, dual adjustable air vents, but no third climate zone, a USB-C and USB-2 outlet on the back of that console as well. And in the drop-down armrest, you've got a further two cup holders. Now, in terms of uh, other dimensions, the only other thing I'll say is you wouldn't want to be too much taller than me because I think your head might hit this roof here. But other than that, look, this is a really impressive back seat. Boot space comes in at 402 litres to the top of the back seat, which isn't massive, but it's okay. And there's a frunk too, which measures in at a pretty solid 134 litres. What's particularly cool about the Mac E's frunk though, is the fact that it's watertight and can be drained out. So you can shove a wetsuit or muddy work gear in there, or even fill it with ice and drinks. Now each Mac E grade gets a slightly different powertrain. So the base car gets 198 kilowatts, it's rear wheel drive 430 newton meters as well. This mid-spec grade, the premium, ups that to 216 kilowatts, but with the same 430 newton meters, and again, it's rear wheel drive. To up the ante altogether, you can of course go to the GT, which nearly doubles those outputs and switches it up to all wheel drive underneath. It nearly halves the zero to 100 kilometer sprint time. See those figures on your screen now. There are two battery packs in the Mach-E range, which is an interesting story. The base car gets a more affordable, but not as powerful LFP battery, which measures in at 71 kilowatt hours. It can travel 470 Ks on a single charge, which suggests a reasonable energy efficiency. Meanwhile, the premium and GT grades have a different 91 kilowatt hour battery pack using the more widespread, but more expensive and higher performance NMC battery chemistry. Range is majorly upgraded on the premium to 600 Ks, while it takes a significant hit for the performance-oriented GT thanks to its all-wheel drive system, with that top-spec SUV only traveling 490 Ks between charges. Either way, these ranges compare favorably to the Mac es rivals, including the Ionic 5, EV6, and Model Y. 
Now, no matter which Mustang Mac E grade you pick, the charging specs are the same. You've got 150 kilowatt peak on DC or a 10.5 kilowatt peak on AC through that Type 2 charging port. Now, that does mean a charging time of about 32 minutes for the base car or 45 minutes for the premium or the GT. Okay, Mustang Mach E behind the wheel. This is the real make or break for this car because as we know, it wears that Mustang badge and it's got a lot to live up to when it comes to the drive experience. So what do we make of it? Well, for a start, it's certainly no sports coupe. You're sitting high enough off the ground that it definitely feels like an SUV. So make no mistake about that. What you're buying here isn't what Mustang's been known for in the past, but it is something new entirely. And while there are elements here that do remind me of Ford's SUV range, which I actually think is not an insult. I think Ford's SUV range is quite underrated. Cars like the Puma and the Escape, I, I actually think they're quite good. And so driving this reminds me a little of those, but there is something really quite different built into this car. There's little immediate things like how direct and real this steering feels. You do get a great sense of control in this car and a great sense that it handles a little bit a cut above most midsize SUVs. There's also a really immediate response from that accelerator pedal, and you get a one pedal driving mode as well, which for EV drivers is a great thing to have. Now, in terms of straight line performance, I have driven all three variants now, and the one I'm in at the moment is that base select car. And I've got to say, even though it does have the least powerful of the motors available to you, it is still plenty. Like 198 kilowatts is a lot to play with, and in a straight line, well, I'm not complaining about the performance in this base car at all. When you move into the premium, that mid-grade carb, you do get a few more kilowatts, but it's also a bit heavier because it's got a larger battery and it's that NCM as well. So yes, the output's a little bit better, but I think the performance is quite even between the two more entry-level vehicles here. Now we did take the GT out on the track and it is really where this car and this chassis can come alive. Yes, it is a lot faster in a straight line thanks to that double power output and that top GT spec, but on top of that, it also comes alive in the corners. It really feels like that's what that car was engineered for. It's not engineered to slide in quite the same way as some other cars are. It's not engineered to feel as crazy in a straight line as a supercar, for example, even though it's got huge power outputs, but it is enormously fun when you're steering it around a track and feeling the weight of the batteries move around and the balance that's on offer with this Mac E frame. So yeah, there's no question that no matter which Mac E grade you get, you're getting a solid dollop of performance. And it doesn't feel quite as sterile as it does if you're driving a Tesla. There is something a bit more fun and playful about this car than the experience I had driving a Tesla Model Y Performance. Obviously the Model Y Performance is very quick, but maybe not as fun. There's a rather nice level of refinement to each Mach E grade as well. The accelerator's got a nice roll on, the regen in single pedal mode, as I've been mostly driving it today, uh, is quite tame as well. It's not really in your face like some EVs can be. Um, and as well, the ride, well, that's probably the most important thing. It's a little stiff, but not too stiff. I actually find that it's uh, more forgiving than most EVs I've driven, especially with batteries this big at this price in this market segment. So I'm pretty impressed with the ride here. It's a little firmer than maybe your Ionic 5, um, but not as firm as something like a Polestar 2 or a Tesla Model Y. So I think a really nice balance actually. It, it's a balanced ride, it's quiet in the cabin too. Um, and I feel like it's quite a comfortable space. So uh, very little to complain about on the driving front here. Now the drive modes do alter the experience uh, quite significantly. Uh, it's not too digital in the way some EVs can be. Like there is always kind of an organic component to the steering and quite a bit of feedback from uh, things like the, the pedals and stuff as well. And from the chassis, which is quite reactive. But the three drive modes, you've got Whisper, that's more an eco drive mode. Apparently it's quite good for low traction conditions as well. You've got Active, which is your normal drive mode that should balance the steering and accelerator inputs. And then you've got Untame, which is your sport driving mode designed for when you're you know, in the curvy stuff or maybe on the track. Now, if you do splash for that full spec 
GT, you will get the untamed plus drive mode and you can turn the ESC uh, not fully off, but down and it'll let you do things like get the car into a full slide and eke out a few more skids when you're in the corners and, and make it a whole lot of fun to drive. So yes, not entirely brash like the Mustang nameplate is known for, but it's not to say you can't have a lot of fun in this EV. So where does that leave a Mustang Mach-E in the grand scheme of EVs at this price? Well, it's a totally different experience from the Ionic 5, but it's more similar to something like an EV6. It's much sportier. The intent on the road is much more serious, but I think this car's got a real fun streak, which I quite like about it. And it's something really unexpected. I was looking at it thinking, yes, it wears a Mustang badge, uh, but it's a midsize SUV. You know, how much fun can it be? Well, I don't know. There's a spirit to this car, which I really quite like. Regardless of which Mac E grade you're looking at, all of them have the same suite of active safety equipment, including all the core stuff like auto emergency braking, lane keep aids, and blind spot detection. The Mac E carries a maximum five star ANCAP safety rating, although it's only valid for the select and premium grades, the GT remains unrated. Ford's warranty is similar to most of its mainstream competitors at five years and unlimited kilometers, although it is notable that the EV6 scores a longer seven year promise. Like many other EVs, the battery warranty is longer at eight years, although it is limited to 160,000 kilometers. Thankfully, servicing is also relatively affordable at just 135 or 180 at alternating years for the first 10 years, and roadside assist is automatically topped up with each service up to the seven year mark. The Mustang Mach-E is controversial, but it is still a hoot to drive, and with its range and its specs, it actually does hold its own against those more established rivals that we talked about. It's certainly not a Mustang, at least not in the traditional sense, but it is something, a new future for a new Ford.